And it starts with a lecture, and then later you'll have an opportunity to use the telescopes and you do different activities. Um, today, we're having our talk by Margaret Akafe, and we will still have activities, and you'll have the opportunity to view the telescopes, but you can't use them to see the sky given the current weather conditions. Um, but before we get into today's event, um, I would like to quickly just go over some upcoming events. So next month, we won't be having astro tours on the first Thursday. We're going to be having special astro tours for Earth Hour. So that will be on huh, it's March, Saturday, March 25th, not the 26th, whoops. Um, and we're going to have a bunch more information about this event up on our social media. So please keep an eye out for that. And for other upcoming events, um, there's going to be astronomy on tap happening in the Great Hall again on uh, Friday, March 10th at 8 p.m. You can visit the Dunlap Facebook page for more information on that. You can also check out RASP to see what other events are happening around here. And just a final shout out for events coming up. Tomorrow, there is a group, um, one of the University of Toronto physics groups is hosting a comet watch party. Um, there should be a QR code. Okay, um, we will find a QR code for that. And you, if you look up the UTAAS comet, you should be able to find information about that. Great. So now on to tonight's speaker. So Margaret Akape is a PhD candidate in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics here at U of T. Um, having attended PESIA in the past years, she is now a PESIA undergraduate a stream instructor. She's helped organize the PESIA mentorship program, a platform to connect PESIA students with professional astronomers from around the world. Her interest in astronomy started at a very young age, and that interest has been sustained by the numerous unknowns in the universe. Her current work tries to understand the nature of the early universe using simulated data. And as a side note, she's also my office mate. So I'm now <laughs> gonna pass it off to Margaret. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much Simran for that introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Good, okay, thank you all so much for coming out this uh, very cold evening to hear my talk. Um, today's talk is about the Pan-African uh, School for Imagine Astronomers, but before I begin, I would like to give a little bit more introduction uh, to myself. So I became interested in astronomy at a very young age. I think I was um, around five or six, and I saw a shooting star one evening when I was out with my family. And I immediately had lots of questions. The only person uh, beside me that could answer, that I could direct my questions to were my, was my dad. And so I asked him why the star was moving. I asked him why the other stars were not moving. I asked him when the other stars were going to move. You know, I had so many questions in my head. And obviously my dad was not able to uh, respond to most of my questions, but those questions were with me for a very long time. And when it was time, uh, when I was in high school, I decided I was going to become an astronomer and answer those questions for myself. And so when I went to the university, I enrolled for a physics and astronomy program. And for my undergrad thesis, um, I worked on constructing a 2.4 meter radio telescope uh, um, from locally uh, available materials. And then I moved on to do a master's program where I studied uh, the remnant of a uh, supermassive black hole major. So we know that uh, in the middle, in the centers of very massive galaxies, including our Milky Way galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole in the center. And when these two galaxies merge, we expect that the supermassive black holes in their centers would also merge. Uh, so my project here was to figure out what the remnant of that merger would be. Um, this, I, I did all of this because uh, I was still very unsure of what subfield in astronomy to focus on, and so I tried, uh, I tried everything. 
Um, after this project, I moved on to uh, Toronto, where I did a master's pro program. And one of the projects involved uh, observing nearby galaxies. Um, for this project, it was really exciting because I was able to travel to uh, actual telescopes in the world and use those telescopes to observe, to make uh, observations of nearby galaxies in order to characterize uh, their motions. And this is an image of the uh, telescope in, in uh, Arizona. Uh, right now, for my PhD, I'm doing something different. Again, I am focusing on cosmology. Um, this slide here shows um, the, our current understanding of the history of the universe. So the universe is everything that we can see, everything we can touch, everything we can feel, everything we can measure and detect. It includes everything, we, all living things. It includes the planets we see, uh, the stars, galaxies, everything you can think of is the universe. Um, so scientists believe that the universe began in an event called the Big Bang, which took place nearly 14 billion years ago. At uh, the time, the whole universe was inside a bubble that is uh, thousands of times smaller than a pinhead. It was really hot, it was really dense. Then the universe began to expand. In a fraction of a second, it, the universe grew from being smaller than an atom to being bigger than a galaxy. Um, as the universe continued to expand, it grew to a point where uh, the primordial elements that the universe was made up of could form neutral hydrogen, the simplest elements there is. Um, this meant that the light from the very beginning of the universe could, could travel unhindered, so it, it didn't have to bump into the uh, protons and the neutrons and electrons uh, in the early universe. And this is the origin of the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the first light in the universe that we see. Um, afterwards, the universe went into a phase we call the Dark Ages because there was no more light source in the universe at the time. But as the universe continued to expand and cool, this uh, hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom uh, that was formed could clump together. And after so many years of clumping, they became dense enough that the first stars were formed. These very first stars, this uh, shown by the arrow in the slide, these very first stars uh, gave off hot ionizing radiation that caused the universe to uh, become ionized. This means, this means that the electrons in the hydrogen atom were stripped off from the, from the atom, and we call this time in the universe's history the epoch of reionization. And um, in this image, we are currently uh, where the arrow is. That is where we are right now from the beginning of time. And um, for my PhD thesis, I am looking into understanding the details of those very four stars that formed. Uh, so, and that is called the epoch of reionization. But what exactly happened at the epoch of reionization? Um, this video here is showing w how we think the transition uh, progressed. Our current model uh, assumes that the transition from being neutral to ionized happened by these four stars giving off their radiations in bubbles, uh, which is shown by the bluish white regions in this video. And these bubbles continue to grow and eventually overlap until the whole universe becomes uh, ionized and transparent, the universe we see today. So my current research is trying to understand some of the properties of those very four stars that formed. Uh, in particular, I want 
I want to know how big those four stars were. I want to know how long it, it took the universe to transition from being neutral to uh, being totally ionized. Okay, now to the reason why we're here, the Pan-African School for Imagine Astronomers, PASIA for short. So what is PASIA? PASIA is a biannual experiential short course in astronomy for African university students designed and taught by a team of uh, astronomers and science educators from Africa and across the globe. Um, like in most places, there are very few astronomy programs in the university and this program is meeting the need of introducing astronomy students to, uh, so that they are aware of possible career path uh, in astronomy if they choose. And there is also a growing need for a critical mass of astronomers on the continent with the rise of uh, telescopes such as Meerkat and the SKA. Um, PASIA's vision is to build a critical mass of astronomers in Africa and exchange ideas uh, about teaching across, this con across various continents. PASIA was founded in 2013 by astronomers based at the University of Toronto and these people were mostly graduate students and postdocs at the time and uh, professors at the University of Nigeria. Um, the current co-directors of the PASIA school are listed here. Um, Dr. Linda was a postdoc when the school was founded and Dr. Jaili was a graduate student at the time uh, in Toronto. Uh, PASIA is made up of a group of international collaborators of instructors and here I'm showing a, snapsh a snapshot of a few of the team. Uh, one of our colleagues at this day, Ibik, is actually in the audience today. Um, PASIA instructors also include uh, five of their alumni right now, including me and Adeze and a few more other people. And a few of our instructors have connections with U of T, uh, either as current or past graduate students, uh, current or past postdoctoral fellows. Uh, those are the people highlighted in the red circles. Uh, this is a map showing uh, where instructors come from for the school. Sh uh, this shows how global the instructor team for PASIA school is. Our instructors come from various places around the world. Okay, so PASIA began in 2013, like I've said before. Uh, it began as the West African International Summer School for Young Astronomers. Wysia. And um, the first school in 2013 held in Nigeria, uh, in Abuja, Nigeria. By the side, I am showing uh, a Google photo of the areas where each school, each school held. So PASIA started in Abuja 2013. We had students mostly from Nigeria and from Ghana at the time because uh, those were the two major countries in West Africa that uh, speak English. Our instructor team wasn't very flexible with uh, the French language that most other countries around the West African U region speak at the time, and so we were mostly restricted to those two countries. Uh, the next school in 2015 held in Nigeria again in another town, Enugu State, Nsuka. Um, this time as well, most of our students, most of our participants were from Nigeria and Ghana. Uh, in 2017, we moved and the next school held in Accra, Ghana. 
uh, at this time we had increased our reach and we had participants from Nigeria, we had participants from Ghana and um, Senegal, a few other countries around the Western African region. And in 2019, uh, the school held again in Nigeria, at this time in Abuja. Um, again, at this time, we had lots of more participants from other countries around West Africa. Uh, the, the most recent school in 2022, now we have uh, enlarged our reach and have moved from being West African focused to being uh, the Pan-African School for Emerging Astronomers because we need to reach a wider community of people. And the most recent school in 2022 held in Livingston, Zambia. Um, so how do, we, how do the instructors of PASIA collaborate effectively? PASIA is created uh, by global collaboration of astronomers and educators. Like I've said, we saw the map of all the regions where uh, our instructors come from. We don't all live and work in the same institution. And so months and months before each school, we have lots of virtual preparation, uh, preparatory meetings. Uh, but how do we ensure that every instructor have a voice and contribute equally to developing our curriculum. Um, the PASIA school is a week-long summer program for the students, but the week before the school begins, the instructors uh, uh, engage in an instructor training week, a, a workshop for the instructors. The teaching teams work together during that week to learn the inquiry facilitation that the students will go through. Uh, they work together to build content and to develop their teaching plans and share ideas about teaching and learning. This workshop is uh, very essential for facilitating the collaboration among our global team and for creating an equitable teaching community for all instructors. Here you see on the slide, you see uh, the instructors working together and learning from each other uh, planning in planning for the school that we hold the week after. Um, PASIA's curriculum is designed to engage the student's scientific interest. It is very different from a regular classroom, a regular workshop where uh, instructors uh, stand in front of the classroom and just give give lectures. Um, the school is broadly divided into two streams that run uh, simultaneously. We have the undergraduate stream. Uh, this is focused on university students that uh, major in science. Um, attendees of the undergraduate stream take part in um, interactive lectures on basic astronomy, they, they uh, participate in an inquiry learning activity, and there are lots of roundtable discussions and many more. Um, the undergraduate students mostly learn about uh, diverse astronomy topics like the solar system, they learn about radio astronomy to cosmology. They learn about these topics, mostly through interactive co-taught lessons. Uh, each lecture is taught by a pair of international and African uh, instructor. And this ensures that uh, um, every of our um, students, every, of, every phase of the learning centers around the students' uh, voices and incorporate the local perspective of the region. The apex of the PASIA astronomy curriculum is a two-day inquiry activity on distances in the universe, as shown in this image. Uh, in inquiry-based teaching, students learn science in ways that mirror uh, uh, authentic 
scientific research. And these activities usually begin through a hands-on uh, a, a hands challenge about finding distances in the universe. So a major question we ask during the inquiry activity, during this inquiry activity, is how do astronomers know the distances to objects in the universe? Um, in, in most cases, the first step in answering an astronomy question is finding the distance to an object. Um, and the most common way that astronomers find distances to objects in the universe is through this method that I will explain um, in a moment called the parallax method. It is uh, very useful in astronomy uh, to find distances to objects. And this is how it works. If the lights were on and you stretch out your hand, you hold out your hand, uh, you can close one eye, maybe close your right, your right eye and place your, your thumb over an extended object in the distance. Maybe you can cover my head with your thumb. If you uh, switch your eyes so that now you open the eye that was closed, and close the eye that was opened, what you will observe is a shift. So you see that your thumb appears to have moved from where it was before, right? And, and this is what, this is, this is the parallax. Um, you can uh, calculate that shift, that the, the shift between your thumbs and the distance between your eyes to find out how far away your thumb is from your eye. Um, when it comes to measuring distances to other stars, because the distances are huge, uh, the, your two eyes can, the distance between your two eyes is not enough to do the trick. And so we need to find really huge baselines, as it is called. Um, and the biggest baseline that we are able to come up with right now is the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so when we take measurements, uh, it, we know that it takes a year for the Earth to go around the sun. And so when we take measurements at a particular time, if we wait six months when we are on the other side of the Earth's orbit and take the same measurement, we are able to get a longer baseline. And uh, when we put our two measurements together, so the first measurement we take, let's assume in January, we are trying to observe this, this star here. Uh, with regards to the background object, we see an image like this. And six months later, when we look at the same object, we see uh, the star aligned like this with regard to the background objects, the shift from one of these positions to the other can tell us how, uh, how far away the star is from us. Um, okay, so I am going to show a short video right now. Okay, this video is showing PASIA particip participants in 2017 in Accra, Ghana, exploring parallax as they take part in the inquiry investigation.
Okay. Uh, so yes, those uh, PASIA participants in 2017 in Accra, Ghana, uh, working on the um, inquiry activity. Um, so I, I would urge you to think about this problem for yourselves. Um, imagine you have uh, a balloon in the distance. Uh, imagine you had uh, uh, an object like a hanging balloon in the distance and you wanted to figure out the distance to the balloon, but you are not able to take a tape rule or a ruler to measure the distance. How would you find the distance to that object? Okay, um, so that is one of the activities uh, at the PASIA school for the undergraduate stream. Um, another major activity is uh, the group teaching activity. Um, this usually starts with an investigation. So we have uh, images of various astronomical objects uh, placed around the room and students are asked to take a look at at all of these um, uh, pictures, all of these images, and just write down all the questions they have about the objects. Um, so you see students uh, writing down questions about this sunspot uh, in this image, and it, uh, examples of the questions students ask uh, is shown here on the slide. We um, uh, we then collate all of these questions and uh, put them into groups. Uh, we put the students into groups uh, to investigate a particular uh, question. In all of this, we, the instructors, we uh, don't give the students the answers just like that. We facilitate them and uh, help them uh, get to the goal of figuring these questions out for themselves. Uh, then we use the jigsaw uh, method to empower students to take ownership of all of these results that they've discovered and communicate their findings to uh, the rest of the, the group. Uh, community outreach is also a very core, uh, it's a core element of the PASIA program. Uh, examples include uh, visits to local schools. We uh, have stargazing parties, and we have uh, solar observing uh, night, solar observing uh, sessions, and public lectures. We also have night observation, uh, sometimes uh, weather permitting. Um, so, PASIA school, PASIA program mostly targets university students, but at that point, uh, students in the university already have, mostly have a clear path of, um, of their career uh, plans, and we understand that most students are really not aware of astronomy as a career option from an early stage. And so the team members uh, spend a day during the instructor training week to uh, engage in astronomy outreach to local schools around the host city, mostly high schools and elementary schools. So the students are always very excited to look through telescopes like you can see in these images and they usually have lots of questions. This is uh, an image uh, of students taking notes when um, uh, an instructor is giving a very brief lecture about an, astronom an astronomical object. So the second stream uh, I mentioned, PASIA, is broadly classified, uh, separated into two streams that run simultaneously. We have the undergraduate stream, which I have just described. The postgraduate stream is the next. Um, so the undergraduate stream, we mostly teach topics uh, and we have the inquiry activity that students are engaging. But in 2015, we realized that these skills, uh, even though they are fundamental, they are 
are foundational and very necessary, but they are not sufficient for building a well-rounded scientist. And so we introduced a postgraduate stream uh, in 2015 that has now been held in every school ever since. Uh, the postgraduate program is designed to equip students with the skills, uh, the knowledge, and the thinking patterns that is required to develop them into a professional astronomer. And the topics we cover uh, include uh, coding, uh, how to how to make observations with telescopes, how to process that data, and how to analyze the data, just like a professional astronomer would. Uh, in 2017, uh, when we held the school in Ghana, we had access to the 32-meter radio telescope in Ghana, and the students were able to use this telescope to observe an astronomical body and they had sessions where they analyzed this data and um, uh, I think it resulted in a publication uh, for the school. Um, however, when we, the school held in 2019, we were back in Nigeria, in Abuja, Nigeria, and there was no uh, physical access to a telescope, uh, but we were able to apply and get time with the Las Cumbres uh, Observatory. Um, PASIA became a global sky partner for this, and what it means is that we are able to conduct our own fully sponsored uh, educational projects and investigations using any of their telescopes around the world. Um, and so in 2019, we uh, had roughly 30 students in the postgraduate program and we were able to split them into groups where they could plan observations using any of the uh, Las Cumbres uh, observatory telescopes and analyze. So they plan observations, they request the data, and they analyze it as it comes. Um, they were again introduced into coding. They learn a bit about, about the, their target objects and they plan uh, the observations and uh, analyze, analyze the script. We understand that not everyone is going to become an astronomer, but um, the knowledge of coding that the students learn is very vital because, because uh, coding uh, is a very useful tool uh, today, especially for people working in STEM, STEM fields. And so it is uh, Really, it's really nice that we are able to introduce and include this core coding component in our postgraduate stream. Um, here, I am feature, I'm showing uh, some of the work from one of the groups in the 2019 school. Um, this is the image that the students observed. And after doing lots of work, they were able to analyze the, uh, uh, the, the data they got. And here is uh, a plot showing how the light of the object is fluctuating. Okay. Um, so ultimately, this school, this uh, activity was a success because for the first time we were able to uh, engage these students uh, on a hands-on project uh, involving actual data from actual telescopes. Um, okay, and so these uh, groups of students worked on this data and they were able to classify the objects that they observed. Uh, this is a special kind of star called an RR Lyrae star. So an RR Lyrae is a type of variable star. 
uh, a variable star is just a star whose brightness, uh, as seen from the Earth, it changes over time. Uh, this, this change can be caused by a number of factors, uh, but um, this is a special kind of star that the brightness changes because of what's happening inside the star itself. Um, afterwards, 20, uh, so, okay, so that was, that was 2019. The next school was to hold in 2021, uh, but we were in the middle of a pandemic and we, we couldn't travel because of uh, lots of travel restrictions, uh, health concerns, and so much more. Uh, but up till then, Pasia has been a very focused, uh, in-person focused, and so a lot of our activities had to do with interactions, uh, discussions, things that are not easily achieved in an online setting. Uh, so we had to adapt, we had to do something different, and we thought to ourselves, could we still do something that is instructive, uh, that is engaging, engaging the students in astronomy and learning while everyone is uh, not in the same place. And so we sent out a call for an alumni research program uh, in June of 2022. And we premiered the first large-scale remote learning component for PASIA. Uh, again, we applied to the Las Cumbres Observatory, and this time we were selected again and awarded 32 hours of observing time. This is more than, the, more than uh, the number of hours we had in the 2019 school. And so we were able to uh, take, we were able to invite uh, over 60 of uh, PASIA alumni to take part in this uh, fully online program for the first time. And uh, we were able to switch up the targets a bit, but of, uh, ideally the students were going over the same projects like the students in 2019 uh, uh, did. So there are a number of challenges uh, with doing an online school, as we probably all know. Um, and one of the ways that we were able to tackle these challenges were was to put out short videos every week to introduce topics, uh, respond to questions, and we engage students in various online platforms like Zoom and Slack, and we're able to uh, make the students collaborate on their coding exercises uh, using various platforms uh, that serve that purpose. And the final uh, presentations for the students when they are done um, investigating and analyzing their data was to communicate their, their results to the rest of the group. And we allowed students to be flexible in the method they wanted to use to communicate these results. Some people uh, decided they were going to write a poem about their objects, other people, like we, we gave them freedom to choose however they wanted to uh, communicate the results to the rest of the group, which was really exciting. Um, the PASIA school is made up of many more activities than I've just described. We have a session on cultural astronomy, which is really informative because we're bringing lots of people from different cultural backgrounds. And astronomy is a science that is as old as man, as humans uh, themselves. Each culture has their unique way of engaging with astronomical objects. So we have sessions where we discuss and share our night sky stories with one another. 
Uh, we have night sky observation sessions. We have public lectures in uh, the local university. We have a session where we introduce different careers in astronomy to the participants. And we also have sessions where we help and guide people who are looking to apply for graduate programs. Uh, obviously, we are not all work and no play. When we uh, go to a new location, we also uh, engage, interact with the, uh, with the, the people of the place where we uh, go to. This is an image from, or these are images from our last visit, our last school in Livingston, Zambia. Uh, lots of Lots of very cool animals live among the people in Zambia. And so this is, we saw a group of elephants when we were just driving by. It was really exciting. And this is uh, a photo of a group of instructors at the Mosi Otunya Falls, uh, popularly known as the Victoria Falls in the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe. Um, this, this is really exciting. The Victoria Falls is uh, roughly twice the height of the Niagara Falls. And so if you ever take a trip to the southern part of Africa, you should definitely uh, go and see this. <laughs> okay, so uh, every time we send in applications for the Pasia School, we get over uh, almost 200 applica applications from people who would like to participate. Um, ideally, we uh, invite around 50 to 70 students every time. Uh, these people are invited from their various countries, and they are fully funded to participate in the school. So their flights to the location, their accommodation, feeding, everything is taken care of. And for that, I want to say a big thank you to all of our funding partners. This, this list is not exhaustive. This is just uh, a group of our funders, the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto is uh, one of our biggest funders so far. And we also have a group of crowd funders uh, to thank. Um, yeah, so writing every time, months and months before each school, uh, PASIA instructors uh, have to write proposals uh, to various organizations asking for funds to run the school. And this is a good way, a good skill for some of, for most of the instructors to, to develop uh, since most of us are graduate students and postdocs. It is essential that we know how to uh, write proposals and grants for events like this. Uh, so obviously, uh, the transition from West African International Summer School for Young Astronomers to the Pan-African School for Imagined Astronomers now has a wider reach. We started in West Africa with the school holding in uh, Nigeria and Ghana and participants mostly from those two countries. But over the years, we have uh, expanded to other countries around the Western African region in 2019, we went even further than that. And now, uh, with the Pan African International, the Pan African School for Imagine Astronomers, we had uh, participants coming from over 12 countries around the continent, including uh, Egypt in North Africa. Uh, in 2020, we sent out a survey to gauge our impact uh, because we have a growing number of uh, alumni and some of the results of that survey was very exciting. Uh, we found out that a lot 
92% of our alumni are currently working or studying uh, in STEM. A lot of our alumni have uh, moved on to graduate programs around the world. And uh, we saw that uh, the school uh, has influenced a lot of uh, people in their career decisions. A huge number of uh, participants said that they, uh, they engage in outreach since the school, and a very huge number say that the Pasia school has influenced how they in turn teach in their various uh, institutions. 88% um, say that attending Pasia has affected their choice of career because we see an increased number of students go to graduate programs in astronomy around the world. Uh, I would like to end with this quote that I like so much uh, from one of our attendees. It says that Pasia made them realize that they can think and find answers to questions on their own without external help. I can now say I can think like a scientist. Another quote uh, from uh, another alumni says they really love the way that they were allowed to discover parallax for themselves and wish learning in school was as interactive. Uh, like I said, we have a growing number of alumni and this map shows uh, the current location of most of our alumni. So uh, most, of, most of us have gone on for graduate programs around the world and uh, a group of, this, this map shows where we are currently. Uh, okay, so if you would like to learn more and stay in touch with our activities, please follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter, you can also view our website. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Margaret, for that really interesting talk and being able to learn about some of the programs that you're helping run. Um, we can now take time for questions. I'm gonna turn a light on so you can see people <laughs> a bit better. Yeah. Raise your hand if you have any questions for Margaret, and you can choose who you'd like okay, to. Sure. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. When was established? It was, uh, okay, that is a very good question. Uh, the question is, when was PASIA established? Uh, PASIA was established in 2013. And the school is biannual, so it runs every two years. Does that answer your question? Yeah? yeah. Okay, great. Go ahead. Um, do you have any uh, like, former students that, uh, that you've heard are considered trying to become instructors in this program uh, through, through because of your impact? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, do you have any former students, uh, alumni of the program, that are considering trying to become instructors for it because of the impact it's had on them? Ah, yes, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, the question is, do we have uh, uh, former students, alumni of the program that would like to become instructors of the same program? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I used to be a student of the PASIA program, and I'm now an instructor. And we have various other people, including uh, uh, Deze in the audience, who were both students of the program and now are instructors. A few of, a few a uh, number of us instructors were once students of the school. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Ah, thank you. That is uh, another good question. The question is, why did we choose to, why did we decide to change our name to Pasia, right? Uh, so we did change the name because uh, we realized that we wanted to expand from a West African focus school to a Pan-African school, and hence the change of name. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, go ahead, yes. What do we use coding for? Thank you. That is, that is a very good question. <laughs> um, that is a very good question. We use coding for virtually everything. Everything. Everything we do, uh, mostly everything we do, we use code to, we, 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 uh, uh, use coding for. So we use for people who uh, observe, who use telescopes to observe actual astronomical objects. When you get the data, you need, you need to find a way to analyze that data, right? Uh, well, how? <laughs> um, so you get, the, you get information from the uh, telescope you need to make sense of that information. And the way we make sense of that information is mostly using coding. Does that, did I confuse you? A little bit. Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> so you use coding to analyze the information? Yeah, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm trying to I'm trying to find an analogy. Uh, hmm. I guess so. So um, this is this is probably not going to be uh, make a lot of sense. But if if you have an assignment from school. Say your teacher gives you an assignment that you don't really understand, right? You, what do you do? You take that assignment to your mom or your dad because they're going to help you make sense of that assignment so that you can solve it, right? Now, Yeah, that's kind of what coding does for us. So because we get all of this information and we don't, really understand it, we, we pass it through a computer program, a code, to help us understand, to help us make sense of all of that information. Does that help? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, that was terrible. <laughs> Go ahead, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, that is that is that is a really good question. Uh, so the question is, um, I mentioned the language of instruction was mostly English, and uh, is that still the case, or are we uh, including French, the French language? Um, uh, so we have we have a good number of instructors that are that can speak a second language that can speak French, um, uh, but most of our curriculum is currently developed in English, and um, our instructors are not fully prepared to. Um, to deliver our curriculum in another language just yet, uh, but we're actively working uh, towards that because we have a wide community of uh, non-English speakers around the continent. So we're really looking into that. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. What are the Uh, so far, the countries that we have been to uh, all speak English. So Nigeria, uh, it's English. Ghana speaks English. Uh, Zambia speaks English. We have various local languages, but the language of instruction in schools uh, is English. Yeah. Do we have? Yeah, we probably have time for one more question. One more question. Who is the lucky person? <laughs> Go ahead, yay. How long did it take for you to make this slide? Because I really appreciate it. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That really means a lot to me. Yes. Um, so the question is, how long did it take me to put together the slides? Uh, a few days. A few days. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my God, you've just made my day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess that's it then. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Margaret. That was a really informative presentation and clearly made an impact, which is great. Um, also, uh, before we head over to the other activities,